If it please your neighbor to break the sacred calm of night with the snorting of an unholy trumpet, it is your duty to put up with his wretched music and your privilege to pity him for the unhappy instinct that moves him to delight in such discordant sounds. I did not, did not always think thus. This consideration for musical amateurs was born of certain disagreeable personal experiences that once followed the development of a like instinct in myself. Now this infidel over the way who is learning to play on the trombone and the slowness of whose progress is almost miraculous goes on with his harrowing work every night uncursed by me but tenderly pitied. Ten years ago for the same offense I would have set his house on fire. At that time I was prey to an amateur violinist for two or three weeks and the sufferings I endured at his hands were inconceivable. He played old Dan Tucker and he never played anything else but he performed that so badly that he could throw me into fits with it if I were awake or into a nightmare if I were asleep. As long as he confined himself to Dan Tucker though I bore with him and abstained from violence but when he projected a fresh outrage and tried to do sweet home I went over and burned him out. My next assailant was a wretch who felt a call to play the clarinet. He only played the scale, however, with his distressing instrument, and I let him run the length of his tether also. But finally, when he branched out into a ghastly tune, I felt my reason deserting me under the exquisite torture, and I sallied forth and burned him out likewise. During the next two years, I burnt out an amateur cornet player, a bugler, a bassoon sophomore, and a barbarian whose talents ran in the bass drum line. I would certainly have scorched this trombone player if he'd moved into my neighborhood in those days, but as I said, before I leave, leave him to his own destruction now, because I've had the experience as an amateur myself, and I feel nothing but compassion for that kind of people. Besides, I have learned that there are, lies dormant in the souls of all men a penchant for some particular musical instrument and an unsuspected yearning to learn to play on it, that are bound to wake up and demand attention some day. Therefore, you who rail at such as disturb your slumbers with unsuccessful and demoralizing attempts to subjugate a fiddle, beware. For sooner or later, your own time will come. It is customary and popular to curse these amateurs when they wrench you out of a pleasant dream at night with a peculiarly diabolical note, but seeing that we are all made alike and must all develop a distorted talent for music in the fullness of time, it is not right. I am charitable to my trombone maniac. In a moment of inspiration he fitches a snort. Sometimes it brings me to a sitting posture in bed, brought awake and weltering in a cold perspiration. Perhaps my first thought is, there's been an earthquake. Perhaps I hear the trombone and my next thought is that suicide and the silence of the grade would be a happy release from this nightly agony. Perhaps the old instinct comes strong upon me to go after my matches. But my first cool collected thought is that the trombone man's destiny is upon him and he is working it out in suffering and tribulation and I banish from me the unworthy instinct that would prompt me to burn him out. After a long immunity from the dreadful insanity that moves a man to become a musician in defiance of the will of God that he should confine himself to sawing wood, I finally fell victim to the instrument they call the accordion. At this day I hate that contrivance as fervently as any man can, but at the time I speak of it, I, I suddenly acquired a disgusting and idolatrous affection for it. I got one of powerful capacity and learned to play old Lang Syne on it. It seems to me now that I must have been gifted with a sort of inspiration to be enabled, in the state of ignorance in which I then was, to select out of the whole range of musical composition the one solitary tune that sounds vilest and most distressing on the accordion. I do not suppose there is any other tune in the world with which I could have inflicted so much anguish upon my race as I did with that one during my short musical career. 
After I had been playing Lang Syne about a week, I had the vanity to think that I could improve the original melody, and I set about adding some little flourishes and variations to it, but with rather indifferent success. I suppose, as it brought my landlady to my presence, with an expression about her being opposed to such desperate enterprises, said she, Do you know any other tune about that, Mr. Twain? I told her meekly that I did not. Well then, said she, stick to it, just as it is. Don't put any variations to it, because it's rough enough on the borders the way it is now. The fact is, it was something more than simply rough enough on them. It was altogether too rough. Half of them left, and the other half would have followed, but Mrs. Jones saved them by discharging me from the premises. I only stayed one night at my next lodging house. Mrs. Smith was after me early in the morning. She, she said, You can go, sir. I don't want you here. I've had one of your kind before, a poor lunatic that played the banjo and danced breakdowns and jarred the glass all out of the windows. You kept me awake all night, and if you was to do it again, I'd take and smash that thing over your head. I could see that this woman took no delight in music, and I moved to Mrs. Brown's. For three nights in succession, I gave my new neighbors, Auld Lang Syne, plain and unadulterated, save by a few discords that rather improved the general effect than otherwise. But the very first time I tried the variations, the borders mutinied. I never did find anybody that could stand those variations. I was very well satisfied with my efforts in that house, however, and I left it without any regrets. I drove one boarder as mad as a March hare, and another one tried to scalp his mother. I reflected, though, that if it could only have been allowed to give this latter just one more touch of the variations, he would have finished the old woman. I went to board at Mrs. Murphy's, an Italian lady of many excellent qualities. The very first time I struck up the variations, a haggard, careworn, cadaverous old man walked into my room and stood beaming upon me, a smile of ineffable happiness. Then he placed his hand upon my head, and looking devoutly aloft, he said with feeling unction, and with voice trembling with emotion, God bless you, young man. God bless you for you have done that for me which was beyond all praise. For years I have suffered from an incurable disease, and knowing my doom was sealed, and that I must die, I have striven with all my power to resign myself to my fate, but in vain. The love of life was too strong within me. But heaven bless you, my benefactor, for since I heard you play that tune and those variations, I do not want to live any longer. I am entirely resigned. I am willing to die. In fact, I am anxious to die. And then the old man fell upon my neck and wept a flood of happy tears. I was surprised at these things, but I could not help feeling a little proud of what I had done, nor could I help giving the old man a parting blast in the way of some peculiarly lacerating variations as he went out the door. They doubled him up like a jackknife, and the next time he left his bed in pain and suffering, he was all right, in a metallic coffin. My passion for the accordion finally spent itself and died out, and I was glad when I found myself free from its unwholesome influence. While the fever was upon me, I was a living, breathing calamity wherever I went, and desolation and disaster followed in my wake. I bred discord in families, I crushed the spirits of the light-hearted, I drove the melancholy to despair, I hurried invalids to premature dissolution, and I fear me I disturbed the very dead in their graves. I did incalculable harm and inflicted untold suffering upon my race with my execrable music, and yet to atone for it I did one single blessed act in making this weary old man willing to go to his long home. Still, I derived some little benefit from that accordion, for while I continued to practice on it, I never had to pay any board. Landlords were always willing to compromise on my leaving before the month was up. Now, I had two objects in view in writing the foregoing. One was which was to try and reconcile people to those poor unfortunates who feel they have had a genius for music 
and who drive their neighbors crazy every night in trying to develop and cultivate it. And the other was to introduce an admirable story about little George Washington who could not lie. And the cherry tree, or the apple tree, I have forgotten now which, although it was told me only yesterday. And writing such a long and elaborate introductory has caused me to forget the story itself, but it was very touching. <laughs>